Michigan State plays later today, right? Yeah, I think 2.30, 230. I want to I wanna hear all the Michigan fans give a shout out for Michigan State to win. Come on, Michigan fans. All right, because it could be, it could be Michigan and Michigan State in the, in the final game. Wouldn't that be cool? It's so cool if Michigan State won by a buzzer beater at the last second. Oh, no, I don't care. That, but, I mean, that game, I didn't see it. I just flipped it on this morning on YouTube to see what happened. And what a, what a win. What a, what a moment. What a finish. What a finish. What a breathtaking finish. The buzzer's going off. And a freshman gets the ball, and there's a guy in his face, and he's just falling backwards, and he throws it. And it's a victory. What a finish. The finish of human history is going to be just like that. There's going to be an unexpected one who will come at the last moment, and he will come out of heaven on a white horse, and... And he will be the king of kings and lord of lords and the world won't be ready for it and there'll be some other guy in charge and some other kingdom set up and it'll look like it's over for all of God's people. And at the last buzzer, at the last second, one will come with the armies of heaven and he will come and it will be a buzzer beater and he will set up his kingdom forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And Daniel, Daniel's really the first guy that told us about it because all the other prophets, I mean, they're like looking at the coming of the Assyrians in 722 B.C. to wipe out the northern kingdom. Or they're looking at the coming of the Babylonians in 586 to take over the southern kingdom. Or they're looking at, you know, this kingdom and that kingdom. But Daniel's in captivity in Babylon. And God gives him visions that go way beyond the Babylonian captivity all the way to the end of time the most expansive, comprehensive prophet of them all. They call Daniel the key to biblical prophecy. Because if you can see what Daniel is saying, you'll understand how this game's going to turn out. And you're part in it. And it is so encouraging. It is so cool. I mean, God was the first prophet in Genesis chapter 3, right after Adam and Eve sinned and fell. He came into the garden, and he, he, he looked at Adam and Eve and the serpent, and he said to the serpent, The seed of the woman is going to come into the world and crush you on the head. And you will bruise him on the heel. But that was the very first picture of how it's all going to end. Somewhere a a, a male child of the woman would come and crush the serpent. And somehow then they would bring humanity back to the garden. Back back to paradise again. We've got to get ourselves back to the garden. We can't. God will. And that's the story of the whole Bible. And Daniel in captivity was for some reason chosen by God to show us how it's all going to play out. It, it, it'd probably take a whole semester in a seminary to teach you the book of Daniel. So how do I do that in, in 30 minutes? Well, I thought I would just take two of his prophecies and show you kind of biblical prophecy, the big scope of it from beginning to end, from where Daniel was until Jesus returns. And now I'm going to show you one prophecy that's astounding that gives a lot of detail and focus. And I hope no matter where you're at on this, this thing of biblical prophecy today, if you're an expert or you're new or, you know, you're just coming into this going, what? I mean, I remember 40-some years ago when I became a Christian, I was like, what? The end times, what? The anti-who, Christ? I, I, I didn't know there was any of this, and I was shocked when I read it. I mean, I didn't know any of it. First, I was shocked, and then I was scared because I wanted to get married before Jesus came back. I was like, i got to get married, and we were both worried. Either we were going to die in a car accident, or Jesus would come, and we wouldn't get married. And so I was scared, and then we got married. And then I'm like, well, wait till we have some kids, God. And then, you know, I just want to have more and more grandkids. I just want to pile them on, you know, before. And, of course, I want them to wait until Michigan, Michigan State meet in the final game. I mean, come on. So at first, it shocked me. I'm like, What? What? And then it was like, wait, wait, wherever you're at today, I I just want you to know, God tells us how it's going to play out because he don't want to scare us. He actually wants to calm us. As we look at world events, he wants to just kind of relax us. He wants to know how the whole thing is going to play out. Imagine if you knew 
in your bracketology, some of you do the brackets. Imagine if you already knew how the, who's going to be in the final game, who's going to win. And, and you, I mean, brackets, you'd always win because you know how it's going to play out. Well, what if you know how human history is going to play out? God says, I want you to know how it plays out. And I want you to know that the King of kings and Lord of lords is going to come a second time, and you ought to be ready. So he tells us these things. So here, here we go, Daniel, the book of Daniel. In chapter... Seven. Daniel has a dream, and he sees a vision in this dream. And in this dream vision, he sees human history from where he's at all the way to the end. And the way he sees it, he sees a, a few beasts. Now, I had to go to Hobby Lobby to find some beasts. And they're not all that end time ish and terrifying. I, but I, I think I was the only guy walking around Hobby Lobby looking for weird things that day. Um, and by the way, when I'm done with this sermon, I won't need these beasts anymore, so I'm looking for takers, little kids who might like scary beasts. But Daniel sees these beasts, and the first one is a lion. And it's not a Hobby Lobby lion. It was a terrifying lion with wings, and it was like a frightful lion. And that lion was a picture of Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian Empire. As you read the book, the book kind of interprets these things for us, and, and, and God says, the first there will be the Babylonians, and you're in that right now, and Nebuchadnezzar and his fierce power, and, and, and sure enough, that's, that's what Nebuchadnezzar was. It was like a lion. They, they took over the whole world, and very scary. But there would come another animal after that, and Daniel saw a bear, and it wasn't an ordinary bear. It was a bear that was lifted up on one side. It was a bear that was kind of hunched over like this, and that was the kingdom that took over the Babylonians, the Medo-Persian kingdom, the Medes and the Persians combined. But the Persians were always more powerful than the Medes, so it was an unbalanced kingdom. The Medo-Persian kingdom, the bear, came and took over from the lion. And then Daniel saw a leopard. Again, no leopard at uh, Hobby Lobby, so we'll go with a tiger. But why a leopard? because leopards are fast. Leopards stalk their prey fast. And Alexander the Great and the Greek kingdom came after the Medo-Persian kingdom and with speed and haste and with special warfare equipment and sandals for the feats of his warriors and roads, Alexander in just a few years conquered the world. And then he died at age 30 something. I mean, he conquered the world at the speed of a leopard. And then that, that particular uh, leopard had had four things growing out of it because Alexander's kingdom was divided up after he died into four portions. Dan Daniel saw the leopard. He saw the kingdom of Alexander the Great. And then he saw a fourth beast. And okay, we'll go with T-Rex, but the beast that he saw, had, it was terrifying. It was unlike any other beast. It had teeth of iron, just crushing teeth. And it had 10 horns growing out of it. It was, it was a terrifying beast that caused Daniel to just lose his breath. That was the Roman Empire that came. That was the empire that was in place when Jesus came. Caesar Augustus. Augustus means most high one. He proclaimed himself God. And, and the Roman Empire lasted something like 600 years from about 200 B.C. to about 400 A.D. And, and this beast he saw, this terrifying beast, had 10 horns. And sure enough, the Roman Empire in its later stages, was broken up into 10 sub-empires. And Daniel saw that, but then he saw something else. Out of this 10 horns on this terrifying beast, one horn rose up and took over from the others. And he describes that horn. He describes it. And it's something that never happened in history. It hasn't happened yet. It's something still future. Here's what he saw. The fourth beast, it's a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth. But it'll be different from all other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, and it will trample it down and crush the earth. This kingdom will crush the entire earth. And the ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom, but after them, another king will arise different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings, and this one, this one horn will speak against the Most High God. He will oppress the holy people of God. He will try to change the set times that humanity runs by, the calendar, the clock. And he will change laws 
for all of humanity to operate by. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time, which means three and a half years. Mark that down. Three and a half years, the holy people of God will, will be delivered into the power of this individual who will hate God and hate God's people. But then the court will sit and his power will be taken away and destroyed forever. And then the sovereignty, the power, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High God. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. So Daniel looks and he sees these kingdoms. He sees Babylon. He sees Medo-Persia. He sees Alexander the Great. He sees the Roman Empire. But then he sees something like a a revived Roman Empire at the end times with one king who will, who will change the laws of humanity, change the clocks, change the calendar, cause everything to orient around him. The Bible calls that horn the Antichrist. You can read about him in Revelation chapter 12, chapter 13. Ten horns, everything, the same thing, the beast, the horn, the Antichrist, it's all there. Jesus talked about this too. Jesus in his last discourse, the Olivet Discourse, talked about all these same events and he said it's future, it's still future. But then after he sees that one horn and that, that kingdom at the end, he sees the victor come. In my vision at night I looked and behold, there was before me one like a son of man, one who looked human, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father. He approached the Ancient of Days, and he was led into his presence. And this one, this Son of Man-looking figure, was given authority and glory and sovereign power. And all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And so what, what he saw was after this revived Roman Empire and this Antichrist figure who, who somehow oppresses God's people for three and a half years, boom, the king of kings comes and sets up the kingdom of God on earth forever. The Messiah comes. And in fact, that phrase, the son of man, that was the favorite title Jesus used for himself 85 times. He called himself the son of man. I am the son of man. And when he was saying that, he wasn't just saying, oh, by the way, I'm the son of a man. That wouldn't be very powerful to say, I'm the son of a man. Everybody looked like, well, we all are. Now, he was referring back to this vision of Daniel's vision of one who looked like a son of man, and it became an official title in Judaism of the Messiah, the prince who would come, who would be sent by God to rule the world. That's why when Jesus used this title at his trial before the Jews, the last night of his life, they looked at him, Caiaphas, the high priest, and said, are you the coming one or do we look for someone else? And he said, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and glory. And they looked at him and said, blasphemy. And the high priest tore his robes because they all knew when he claimed the title Son of Man, he was claiming to be that one who would come, who'd been given authority by God the Father to rule the world. He was crucified because he said, I am the Son of Man. That's his favorite title. And so Daniel sees this all playing out and, and, and that last part, that Roman Empire revived with the horn and the Antichrist and the three and a half years and the oppression of God's people and then the, the arrival of the Son of Man. He saw it all playing out. And that's still future, that last part. That's the big picture of biblical prophecy. And you can look at Jesus. You can look at the Apostle Paul. You can look at John in the book of Revelation. It all lines up with this picture of a future kingdom that will come and try to uh, oppress God's people and set up a kingdom on earth and, and then God will intervene. But then you come to Daniel chapter nine and Daniel gives us a very specific prophetic clock. And this prophecy is amazing. It comes in response to his prayers. In Daniel chapter nine, Daniel was reading the Old Testament and he came in the book of Jeremiah to the place where it said that the captivity in Babylon would last 70 years. And when he saw it, he began to pray because he looked at his watch and said, we've been here about 70 years. It must be time for God to restore his people. And so it says, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me, Gabriel the angel. And he said, Daniel, I've come to give you understanding. 
As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. And this angel is going to answer him about the number 70 and about the the 70 years. But the angel is going to surprise Daniel because he's not going to look back at the 70 years of captivity. He's going to look forward and tell Daniel that you can time the rest of human history with that number 70. And he gives the most amazing prophecy anywhere in the Bible. We'll we'll put these beasts back because we're kind of finished with them for a moment. We're going to look at these numbers, and here's here's how they play out. It's a little bit of a puzzle of numbers that you have to figure out to understand biblical prophecy. Here's what the angel said, verse by verse. Verse 24, the angel said, 70 sevens, or 70 weeks, literally, are decreed for your people and your holy city to do six things, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Seventy sevens, and it will be finished. The kingdom of God will come, everlasting righteousness. Here's the deal with the number 70, and when it says 70 sevens or 70 weeks, in biblical prophecy, a week is a group of seven years. So Daniel understood when this angel said 70 weeks for all of this to happen. It was 70 groups of seven years, which is 490 years. And all of a sudden you have a number, you have like a prophetic clock, and, and, and Daniel knew that it was 70 until the end. 70, 70 sevens, 490 years and it's over. And then the angel said, now wait a minute, a little bit more prophetic math for you to understand in the next verse. No one understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Daniel, you're waiting for that restoration. You're waiting for captivity to end and for a decree to send you back. From the time a decree goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, the Messiah, until he comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. So what's seven plus 62? 69, one short of 70. So 69 sevens until Messiah comes. And it says, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. Now, the angel says, there will be 69 sevens until the Messiah comes. And you're wondering, what happened to that other seven? What happened to that other week? that other group of seven years. Hold on to that thought and look what the angel says next. After the 69 sevens, after 483 years, something's gonna happen. The ruler, the prince is gonna come. But listen to this. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death, cut off, and will have nothing. And Daniel's like, wait a minute, no, that's not how the story goes. When Messiah comes, he wins. And Gabriel says, no. When Messiah comes after 69 weeks, after 483, he loses. He is cut off. He dies. And Daniel is shocked that in the the middle of this picture, after 69 weeks, you don't have a king on a throne you have, a, you have a Messiah who has died. You have a Messiah who is somehow lost. You, you have a Messiah who is cut off. When will that happen? 69 sevens after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. I, I didn't have a city of Jerusalem, and Hobby Lobby didn't either, so I had to get a little Scottish castle out of a bookcase at my house. But we'll say this is the city of Jerusalem. And the angel says, from the moment the decree goes forth to build... Start counting. Start the prophetic clock right there. And that decree happened. Nehemiah chapter 2, you can read it. Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, issued a decree in 445 or 446 B.C. for the Jews to return and rebuild their city. And when he issued that decree, boom, the prophetic clock started. 
and 483 years began marching forward until Messiah would become and cut off. When you take 483 years and multiply it times 360 days, which was the prophetic year in the Old Testament, 360 days, you come up to the exact day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. The exact day. And he came in on a donkey because that was how a king would come if he came to make peace. If he wanted to come to make war and assert his authority, he would come on a white war horse. But if he came peacefully to make peace, he would come on a donkey, a colt, a beast of burden, which is exactly what the prophet said. He will come on a foal, a beast of burden, as a servant. And when Jesus came in, and he saw Jerusalem, and people were laying down their branches. We're going to talk about this next week, but they're laying down their branches saying, Hosanna, son of David. Hosanna means save us now, save us now. Son of David, set up the kingdom. Come on, set up the kingdom. Because they thought it was time for the king to rule, and Jesus wept over the city. And he said, if you had only known this day, if you had only known the things which make for your peace, but they've been hidden from your eyes. Because Jesus knew what Daniel knew. He was headed for a cross, not a crown. And so he wept. And this prophetic clock plays out. And then look what it, what it says next. Because you're wondering, where'd that 70th week of Daniel go? Where'd that last seven years go? Well, it says the ruler. After the 62 weeks, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. And then the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and then the end will come like a flood, and war will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. In other words, there's something in the future where the, the ruler who is to come will assert himself again in, in the future of human history. There will be a future time where that that other prince shows up again, the one who tried to put this one to death and who's thought he's won, and he's going to try to set up an earthly kingdom. And then here's how it ends. This other one, this beast, this antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. There it is again. That last missing seven, the 70th week of Daniel, that last period of seven years, he will confirm a covenant with the many for one seven-year period. And in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. In other words, this person, remember before it said, a time, times, and half a time, he will persecute the people of God. Sure enough, in the middle of the 70th week, that final seven years, the kingdom of Satan will turn on the people of God. And this individual will come, you read the book of Revelation, it's not Satan in person because, I mean, who'd want to worship that? So what he does is he puts up a real worshipable person. Thank you, Hobby Lobby. <laughs> he looks so cool. And, and people will worship the beast. But under that hat, there's a horn. Because he's the little horn of the ten. And really, the, the moving force behind him is Satan. It, it's all in Revelation chapter 12, 13, and 14. Satan set up his, sets up his kingdom, puts forth his antichrist. Satan's playing God the Father. This is God the Son. This is the true Messiah. And then he's got this other person called the false prophet who imitates the works of the Holy Spirit and does signs and wonders so that the world will worship this one. And that's where the, the number, the 666, comes. That's the mark of the beast. And the world will have to have some kind of chip or number to, to buy, to sell, to do. It's kind of like they're doing with dogs now. They're implanting a chip. So you just take your dog into the vet, and they just scan your dog. There, there's businesses now that have implanted chips in their employees. So you don't pull out a card to get in. You just scan your hand, and that's what it takes to get in. Somehow in the last days, this kingdom will be set up, and in the middle of that final week, he will break his covenant, and he will persecute God's people. You read the Bible. It's called the tribulation period, the last seven years. And what's happened, you begin to put it together now. The prophetic clock started here, but it, when Christ died and rose again, God put the clock on its side and said, pause. A pause 
in the prophetic clock between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel. And, and that last seven years will not start until God says go. And, and in the meantime, God is waiting for people to come to know him and respond to this, to respond to the first coming of Christ so they can be ready for the second coming of Christ. All throughout the Bible, it's called the times of the Gentiles. It's the church age. Do you know we're living in a parentheses created by God's patience so people can respond to the first coming of Christ? Do you realize Easter means you can invite people during the period of God's patience to respond to the first coming of Christ? Because when this second coming happens, it'll be too late. You're living in a prophetic pause, a gap. And Daniel, when he saw this, it just blew his mind. At the end of the book, the angel says, seal this up, seal this prophecy up, go your way, Daniel, enter into your rest, receive your reward, you'll be raised again at the end of the days. And Daniel just, he let all this rest in scripture for us to see. And you look at it and you say, well, what do we do with that? What do we do with it? At the end of it all, the, the beast will be toppled and the Antichrist will be toppled and, and the return of Jesus Christ, sorry I couldn't find a glorious war horse with Jesus on it at, at uh, Hobby Lobby, but I found this in Jim Baba's office. So we'll put Jesus there holding his lambs and he comes in great power and glory. And Jesus said all this, he said it all. This is what's gonna happen. And so we're waiting for that 70th week. We're waiting for the prophetic clock to start again. What do you do with that? You're gonna go to work tomorrow. You're gonna watch basketball this afternoon. You know, you're going to raise your kids. You're going to struggle through having, having some disease you don't like having. What, what do we do with this stuff? Well, here's what you do. Number one, number one, kiss the sun and relax. Kiss the sun and relax. What do I mean by that? I mean you can watch the news and get all bent out of shape. You, go, you watch the news and you just go, oh, no, you know, somebody's going to push a red button or this guy's going to send, like, some weird agent to, over here to kill our spies and maybe I'll breathe in some powder. I better check out my mail. And you can get all bent out of shape and, and just afraid about the end times. Here's, here's what God says. God says, relax and laugh. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up. The rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. The Lord and his anointed one. They say, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. Let us throw off the rule of God and the rule of Jesus. Let us do our own thing. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. That's why I say, laugh, relax. God's not worried. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger. He terrifies them in his wrath, saying, look, I have installed my king on Mount Zion, my holy mountain. God the Father says, you know, right now in heaven, seated, seated at my right hand, is the king of kings and lord of lords. And when the prophetic clock starts again, he will show up. But God says, I've already installed my king. It's already decided. The bracket's already determined. The champion, the crown, it's already won. The buzzer beater, it's done. God laughs at the nations doing their, their plotting. He says, I've installed my king. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. Now this is the son of God speaking. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, I'll give the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth, your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the sun, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. That's why I say, kiss the sun and relax. You see, in ancient times, when you came into the presence of a ruler, you didn't just say, hey, ruler, how's it going? You walked in, and you got down, and you bowed down, and you kissed the feet of the ruler to show you knew who was ruling. And God says, you know what? You can watch the news all you want. You can watch about 
this Vladimir and this Kim Jong whoever, and you can, you can look at your own president and all the goings on in the world. You can look at that and this and the other thing and the other thing. But as far as I'm concerned, this game is over. And the Son of God, I have already determined, will someday leave the throne on my right hand in heaven. He will show up in the clouds of glory, and it will be over. So you would just do well to kiss the sun and laugh at the TV. And you know what? That's, that, that's helped me a lot over the last 40-some years since I became a Christian because I remember I was at first, oh, no, oh, no, I might not get married. Oh, no, I might not have kids. Oh, no. And then I just realized, like, just kiss Jesus and laugh at the TV. Because when God says it's time, it's time. When God says it's over, it's over. And the champion's already been crowned. Champions are, Jesus will throw the buzzer beater. I guarantee it. And so, yeah, we, I get home every night, and let's watch the 6.30 news, but it's mainly just because we kind of want to laugh a little bit. Do I care about politics? Yeah. But am I all bent out of shape about it? No, I'm not. Kiss the son. Worship him. And, and by the way, if you've never kissed Jesus by opening up your heart and letting him in, I would say you better do that. If you've never invited Jesus to be your savior, he will not be your king in the end. You gotta accept the first coming of Christ to benefit from the second coming of Christ. You have to. You're in the age where the prophetic clock is on pause, but it will start up again someday. And in that day, according to scripture, it will be more and more difficult to say yes to Jesus because according to Jesus, you'll be hated up by all on account of my name. And so I say to you, if you've never kissed Jesus, and accept them as your Savior. I say to you, please, accept the crucified and risen Lord because someday he will be the powerful, glorious king who comes from heaven. Kiss the sun and relax. Second, look forward to this and live a holy life. Here's what Peter says in 2 Peter Chapter 3, he starts the chapter, I won't read it, by he says, in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, say, oh, where's the promise of his coming? Everything continues ever since Jesus left. He's never coming back. They will mock. And Peter says, do not be put off by the mockers. And here's why he's waiting. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the, day, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wishing for anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. Why has he put the clock on pause? Because he wants people to acknowledge Jesus, so he's being patient. You're living in the age of patience. The day of judgment will come, but you're living in the age of grace and patience. And that's what Peter says. He's being patient. However, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Why like a thief? Because nobody knows when the thief is coming, and nobody's ever ready for the thief. I mean, whoever, like, you know, is standing there when the thief walks in, hi, I'm glad you're here. He will come like a thief because people won't be ready. People will be sleeping. A lot of his own people will be sleeping, not ready. The Lord will come like a thief, and in that day, the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare since everything will be destroyed in this way. What kind of people should you be? Peter's writing to Christians. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. The elements will melt with intense heat. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless at peace with him. Look forward to this and live a holy life because he is coming back. And he will call his own people to account for how we've lived. Whatever station of life God has put you in, be faithful in it. Be faithful. Live a holy life. This is real. And he's wondering if you're going to be ready, if you're going to be looking for him. I don't know when he'll come. I don't know if we're in the last days. To me, you know, people ask me that. I say, you know, it's like a checkerboard. And for quite a while, God has had all the pieces in place for the final checkmate the final checkmate. It's like all the pieces are there. Just a matter of time before God just goes, checkmate, game over. 
So are we in the last days? I think it's been prepared for a long time. But I'll tell you what, the patience of God, he could wait another thousand years. He's so patient. You ready? You know how dishonoring it is when you know somebody's coming and you're not there to meet them? A special guest is coming in. They tell you their flight. They're like, you'll be there, right? Oh, I'll be there. And they arrive, and you just forgot. You got busy. And so they come out, they get into baggage claim, they're looking around for a sign, you know, or something, right? There's nobody there. Everybody else is being picked up. Was, well, I'll just go get my bags, because I know there's, there's just a little late. I'll go get my bags. So you get your bags, and you're the last one to get the bags, and you're standing by the baggage thing, and everybody's gone. Nobody there to pick you up. Oh, I'll just go out by the street, because they're out by the street. I know, they're out by the street. They've done the circle thing, and the police have pushed them along. And you just stand there. And there's nobody there. And you finally dial them up. You say, are you coming? Oh, I forgot. That's no, that's no way of honoring somebody. Jesus is like, am I going to show up? And you're like, oh, I forgot. Well, at least today you've been reminded. He is coming, and he wants you to live holy. He wants you to prepare for his return. He wants you to prepare. You're on the winning team. If you know Jesus, he wants you to live like it. And there's one other thing he wants you to do in the meantime while there's still time before he starts the clock up again. And Daniel heard about it in Daniel chapter 12, the last chapter. At that time, Michael, the great prince, Michael the archangel who protects your people, he will arise during this final time. And there will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. The Bible calls this last seven-year period the great distress, the great tribulation. How should we act? But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book of life, will be delivered. You will be protected. You will be protected. But here's what you should do. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth at this time will awake. There'll be a resurrection of the dead, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. But those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. What should you be doing in light of this? The wise person, when it comes to biblical prophecy, is not the person who's figured it all out. So much mystery. But the wise person, according to this, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of heaven. Is your life shining brighter and brighter as the world gets darker and darker? If so, you are wise. And those who are wise will lead many to righteousness. Are you leading people? Are you leading people to the king of kings? Are you teaching people? Are you telling your friends? He came because he loves you. He died for you to take away all your sins. He came, just like he said in Genesis 3.15, to crush the serpent, to take us back to paradise. Will you come with me back to paradise? Are you, are you leading many to righteousness? Will you bring your friends to Palm Sunday, to Good Friday? I mean, it will be so clear on Good Friday, and we'll celebrate communion. And Easter Sunday will celebrate his resurrection, his triumph over death. Will you lead many to righteousness? Those who are wise will. And Jesus will come again someday. And he will, he'll shoot the, the buzzer beater. And, and it's over. And it's true. God doesn't give us this stuff to scare us. He gives us this information to just let us know. This is how the story's going to end. And I want you to, to know you're in a pause, you're in a parenthesis. I'm being patient. I want you to live for me. But the day is coming, and the clock starts, and it will be game over. Lord, we just accept your word. We say thank you that we live in a day of patience, the day of grace the day of the crucified and risen Lord who's calling people to repent and come to himself, waiting for them to kiss him, to do homage to him, to acknowledge him as Lord of lords and King of kings before it's too late. Thank you for the day of patience. Thank you for the pause in the prophetic clock 
caused by your grace, caused by your mercy, because you want people to come home. And so give us the strength that your people to live for things that matter, things of eternity. Give us the ability to, to live holy lives, to shine like the stars of heaven as the world gets darker. May our lives be brighter and brighter. And God, would you give us the grace to lead many, to lead many back, back to you. Today, Jesus, we worship you with our hearts right now. We kiss you. We kiss you. King of kings, we kiss you. Let's stand together and let's just proclaim that today that as nations rise, as nations fall, God is the rock on which we stand, on which we build our life, and he is our firm and our solid foundation, come what may.
the king. A couple things, don't forget, I need some takers for those four little Hobby Lobby animals. And if anybody wants the Antichrist, you can have him too. <laughs> if, if you need a scholarship for the women's gathering or any other retreat here, just know nobody doesn't go because of money. If you come talk to us, we'll make sure you have the money to go. And if we can help you on your spiritual journey in any way, stop up here, talk to us, talk to somebody in the prayer room, especially if you're new and you just want to figure out, how do I take that first step with Jesus? We'd love to talk with you. Jesus, we just, again, worship you. We, we love you. We kiss you today. We kiss you because you died and rose again to take away our sins, to give us eternal life. But we also kiss you because you are the soon and coming King of Kings, the Anointed One. And today, for that, we wait for you, we watch for you, we work for you, and we worship you. In your name, amen. God bless. Go in peace.